Um, okay, so I'm going to try and do a 45-minute uh, lightning talk because I've got way too much material. Um, so I'll see what I can do. Um, now, yeah, th this is basically already the radio edit. If anyone's interested later on in the extended disco version, so talk to me. We'll see what I can do. Um, so the, um, the title may be... Um, I hope I'm not setting the wrong expectations here. I'm not going to give you a checklist that you can take home, um, apply to your application, and then your application will be vulnerability-free, uh, hacker-proof, guaranteed by Cisco, because you know, that's not how it works, obviously. Um, the, um, one, one of the things I'm not going to talk about is all the common attack patterns like cross-site scripting, cross-site request forging, um, injection attacks. I assume you're familiar with those from whichever platform you came from. Um, you know how to apply the mitigations, you know how to find them in the Phoenix plug documentation, all those things are covered there. Um, instead, I'm going to be talking mostly about things that might surprise you coming from another platform, because the Erlang virtual machine is a bit different from, I don't know, what you might be used to. Um, so maybe the talk title should have had Erlang in the title rather than Elixir, but again, I'm, 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 I imagine a lot of people in this room will have come to Elixir from other languages. Um, so, uh, one other word of warning, I'm being paid to be paranoid, so you'll find out through this, uh, throughout this presentation that I'm considering all the possible angles, and you know, that's a good thing usually in security. There's no harm in, in uh, spending a little bit of time looking at a possible weakness in your application or in your stack, um, and then later to decide that you can probably live with the residual risk because there might be other uh, protections in front, like a firewall or other protections that the attacker would have to get through first before being able to um, attack this particular part of your application. But you know, my recommendation is, in any case, track it. If you, if you come across something, or if I mention something here that you might say is a little bit you know, out there, still add it to your backlog because you know, requirements change, um, things change. If you move your application to another deployment environment uh, where suddenly your application is behind the same firewall as somebody else's application. You know, who, who built that application? Is it secure? We don't know. So, um, or another example, your uh, smart home application uh, moves beyond just controlling light bulbs and now it's going to control also the, um, the alarm system or the locks in a house. So obviously you're raising the stakes you want to revisit your threat model and, and see if, if maybe you need to implement some additional protections. So, um, with that out of the way, let's get started. Um, I want to start with the front door of Erlang. Um, I, I had some slides about like, back doors, uh, buffer overflows, um, maybe even uh, Trojans in your dependencies that somehow sneak into a GitHub repository, and you know those are all valid concerns, but. Erlang has this massive front door, which is I mean, really cool. You have, um, we've seen uh, Sandra talk about it the other day. It it's, gives you basically remote access to all the power of the Erlang virtual machine. And we know it's very powerful. We have a, a great standard library, but also very powerful introspection features, um, tracing, debugging tools. And that's all very cool, but you probably don't want that to fall in the wrong hands, all that power. Um, now. Of course, it's, it's in, intended for clustering, but I, I, um, I, in a minute I'll, I'll talk also about uh, an, another use case. Uh, first, a little recap, just to, um, uh, so we're on the same page. So, when an, an Erlang node is started in distributed mode, so uh, the, the virtual machine allocates an ephemeral port for that particular node. Uh, it registers that port with EPMD, the port mapper uh, daemon, which if it's not already running, will be launched as a separate process by the virtual machine. So that port mapper daemon runs on a well-known port, and that's how other nodes can discover the node that you just registered. Um, node registration supports both short names and, and long names. So a name is a, a, an application name at the uh, host name or the fully qualified domain or IP address of your, of your server. Um, but it's worth pointing out that EPMD is not aware of short names or long names. It just cares about the, the, the part before the at sign. Um, so you can't, you know, don't consider um, short names a security feature. It, just because the, the name might not uh, resolve remotely doesn't mean an attacker can't still get into that, that virtual machine. Um, the, the, 
the, the short name, long name um, separation is an artificial separation in the, uh, the, the transport protocol between the virtual machines or, and, and an attacker could bypass those if they, if they wanted to. Just a you know, little side note. But um, anyway, like I said, I want to talk not, first of all, before I talk about clusters, I want to talk about uh, a common use case for a distributed airline, and that's the remote access to a running node. And um, uh, it's already been mentioned a few times today, the ability to, to basically SSH into a server where you have an, a node running, um, and, and seeing your server there, in this case, this server has a Phoenix application running, an application, a node called Phoenix, um, and using an SSH tunnel, I can uh, actually connect to that node from my local machine um, for, uh, for troubleshooting purposes. Um, so if, if you're not familiar with this technique, um, the Plataforma Tech uh, blog just posted a, a nice explanation of this, of this um, SSH tunneling, um, I think just the other day, so you can, I'm, sure, I'm sure you can find it there, some more information about how this works. Um, but once it's in place, you can basically create a remote shell IEX session on your running server. Or you can start Observer locally on your machine, um, as, as Gary just said. And um, then once you open Observer, uh, the, the Observer will have this nodes menu where you will see the remote node. You can connect to it, see all the graphs, see all the supervision hierarchy and everything. Um, so that's, that's all very cool and very convenient, very powerful, but uh, again, you have to be careful with powerful uh, features. So let's look under the hood to, to make sure we understand what is, what's going on here. So forget the Phoenix server on our, on our server. Um, here I'm just starting an uh, IEX session with a short name and you know, EPMD uh, CLI shows me that the, um, the, the server is actually, the node is actually registered. And now let's look what, what Netstat tells me about the ports that the uh, virtual machine and EPMD are running on. Um, the first couple of lines show uh, EPMD, and you can see the listening ports of 4369. Four, they're bound to the wildcard interface. They're not bound to any particular IP address. So even though I specified ho localhost as the, as the host name, of, um, the, the, the EPMD is actually reachable from any network interface. The same thing with the virtual machine. So that's, you know, maybe depending on your environment, it may be acceptable, but, you know, for where I'm coming from, I would say I'm only intending to use this um, uh, distributed airline functionality over the loopback interface when I'm SSH into the this, in, this server. I don't want to expose this service outside my server because it's such a powerful interface. I mean, that's the, one of the first rules of um, Linux server hardening is you don't expose services that you don't need. So let's see if we can tighten this up a bit. It turns out that if you look at the EPMD documentation and the, the kernel module documentation of Erlang, there are ways to, to, to tighten that up. Um, just a public service announcement if you're looking for this kind of uh, information, uh, just check out Erl-man and then the name of your, the, the binary or the module that you're interested in. It gives you uh, like qu quick access to that kind of documentation. Um, so with that information, I can actually pass in some parameters, an environment variable that specifies the address that the EPMD uh, daemon should bind to. And the reason I'm, I'm passing it as an environment variable is because I'm not starting EPMD explicitly in this case. I'm relying on the Erlang beam to, to start the EPMD process for me. So that environment variable needs to be set so that that process can pick it up. I, if I start EPMD explicitly, um, myself, then there's a, a dash address parameter that I can pass. And the other parameter there for the kernel uh, module specifies the interface that the, uh, the, the virtual machine itself should listen on. So with that in place, my EPMD output is pretty much the same. But um, Netstat now tells me that both EPMD and the virtual machine are bound to the, to the loopback interface. So anyone who maybe have a has access to the uh, the local network where my server uh, is, is running will not be able to access these interfaces. So you know, that's one uh, hardening uh, option that you have for using um, uh, distributed Erlang if you're not actually building a cluster. Now 
What if you are building a cluster and you want to actually expose your uh, distributed Erlang on the local network? So one thing you could do is if, if, you're, um, if you control the servers or if you're on a, a virtual private cloud where you can define virtual network interfaces, you can allocate a subnet specifically for communication between the, between the nodes. So you have a, a, the front end network, where, which is fo facing the internet and your load balancers, but another network interface with another subnet where you connect only the nodes of your uh, Erlang cluster, and then you can use this same technique to make sure that the er distributed Erlang is only available over that interface and not over the internet-facing interface. Um, if that's not an option, and if you're uh, running distributed Erlang in an environment that you can't fully trust uh, for example, if you're running uh, Elixir on a uh, Raspberry Pi using a NERV project, so who knows which network you're going to connect to, you might want to uh, secure your distributed Erlang properly. So cookies are not really a security feature. I mean, yes, they will stop a casual um, passerby, let's say, from, from connecting to your node or to nodes that shouldn't really be talking to each other and accidentally ending up talking to each other. But the, for, one of the issues is that the, 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 the authentication mechanism does have, doesn't have any kind of rate limiting. So you can basically brute force your way into a server. It will take some time. But it's, um, so if you really want to harden your distributed Erlang installation, there is a TLS uh, distribution module, which you can swap out, uh, swap in instead of the standard TCP distribution model. And not only does that give you the option to, to have in, uh, increased security by using, for example, client certificates um, uh, or, or PSK-based um, authentication, mutual authentication between the client and the server, you also get very important um, confidentiality of the data because the standard TCP module, all the data that's being exchanged between the nodes is just, um, it's just this Erlang terms uh, serialized into a binary stream. It's, any sensitive data is, is, is right there, unless you take care of that somewhere in your application layer. Um, now, maybe even more important than all of this is to know when not to use Erlang distribution. Um, you know, it, Erlang is, is, is very powerful and, and it's very attractive sometimes to just say, okay, I can do anything within the Erlang virtual machine. I don't need to bring in an external database, an external caching server, an external web server. I'm just going to run all, uh, just virtual machines everywhere, the beams everywhere. Um, I am going to have a front end tier and a back end tier, but they will all be talking over the Erlang protocol. Um, but that, you, that you're no longer building an application with multiple tiers because you know, the, your front end tier, which is exposed to the internet, once an attacker gets in, they will have unlimited access across all your cluster, including the back end servers where your database resides. So if you want, if you're building a multi tiered application for security reasons, to not store sensitive data on the servers that are exposed to the internet. So don't use Erlang distribution between the front-end servers and the back-end servers. Stick to the application-specific protocol, the database protocol, that is much more restricted and that uh, if your front-end server is compromised, will still limit the damage that an attacker can do on the, on the back-end server. Um, and obviously, uh, you shouldn't be using Erlang distribution over one connections, over the internet, um, not just for security reasons, but simply because it wasn't designed to support the kind of latency and, and uh, error rates that you will, you will get in such an uh, environment. Okay, so I, I already mentioned as, uh, TLS, so I want to talk a little bit more about TLS and SSL. Um, some of this is generic, it applies to any kind of language that you're using. Some of it is specific to um, to, to Erlang, and I'll try to use TLS to refer to the protocol and SSL to refer to the module in, in the Erlang standard library, but I might get mixed up. Um, but it, th there, one thing to know is that the SSL module in, in Erlang is a bit different from your standard um, TLS implementation in other languages because everyone uses OpenSSL, but the Erlang um, implementation uses OpenSSL only to do crypto. It doesn't use the, 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 the TLS handshake, um, the X509 certificate processing, the CRL handling, all those things are implemented by the SSL module rather than 
um, delegated down to, to OpenSSL, at least in recent versions of Erlang. And you know, that could potentially have some, some implications. Um, we'll see in the next slide. So the question is, should you use Erlang SSL or should you use the um, a reverse proxy in front of your web server, for example, and, and let the server or the load balancer terminate the TLS connection in front of your application running in the Erlang VM. And now, <coughs> some applications may need the reverse proxy, but although that's less likely for an Erlang application, for a Phoenix application, than it is for a, a Ruby on Rails application, um, in, in Ruby on Rails, for example, you would run multiple copies of your application in order to leverage the, the whatever number of cores and CPUs you have on your server, and then Nginx, for example, would reverse proxy in front of those application instances. And that's not needed in, in Phoenix because Phoenix, out of the box, takes, uh, uses all the available cores anyway. So maybe you don't need a reverse proxy. Maybe you need a load balancer if you have multiple servers. Maybe you don't need a load balancer. If you do need a load balancer, then probably the load balancer will terminate TLS because you'll want to, um, the load balancer to be session aware for session stickiness. If you don't have a load balancer, then the TLS, again, can be terminated by the Erlang virtual machine. And another consideration is do you, do you need to offload the TLS for performance reasons? Um, the, the Erlang TLS implementation is, is pretty good, but uh, you can't beat dedicated hardware that, that actually you know, delegates much of the crypto processing to, to specialized uh, chipsets. Um, but the, from a security perspective, the most in interesting one is the last one, is do, do I trust the TLS implementation of the Erlang SSL module? Because you know, what, what happens if a vulnerability is found in OpenSSL? How do you know if Erlang is affected? Um, is it susceptible to the heartbleed attack, to the beast attack? Um, many of those attacks actually uh, target the, the handshake or the packet processing. They don't target the crypto, the underlying crypto itself. But that doesn't mean that the SSL module is immune to similar attacks. Um, now, you're all waiting to hear my recommendation. I, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, I'm, I'm using the Erlang SSL implementation. Um, I think, you know, it, it, it's... Erlang SSL is it's not being used nearly as much, of course, as OpenSSL, and, and therefore the, um, it will attract fewer uh, attackers. There will be less to be gained by some, for someone to, to find a weakness in the Erlang SSL module compared to finding a weakness in OpenSSL. But that's uh, security through obscurity, and it's no, never uh, really a good idea. So anyway, for the purpose of this talk, let's say you are going to use the Erlang SSL module. Now, and I'm going to talk for a moment about uh, web servers, but basically this applies to any server um, because all the SSL configuration parameters are exactly the same no matter whether you're using Phoenix or Plug or any other kind of TLS application. Um, but for a web server in particular, there is a cool tool called ssllabs.com by Qualys that will test your web server. And what you want, of course, is a A plus rating because that's the best. Um, out of the box, I think, Phoenix, because of the way Erlang uh, configures the, the SSL module out of, out of the box, gets, I think, a B or a C, mostly because it includes the DES cipher, which you really don't need. So you will want to tune your SSL parameters a bit in order to achieve this A-plus rating. And I'll show you how to do that. Um, so this is the config file of, an, of a Phoenix application. Um, Apart from the standard stuff that you need anyway, you will want to add custom Diffie-Hellman parameters. Um, Diffie-Hellman parameters are, are used to, um, in the key exchange at the start of the TLS handshake, and they make sure that you get perfect forward secrecy, which is a good thing. Um, I won't have time to talk about it now, but um, it, the, the thing is that out of, if you don't specify this parameter, SSL module will use standard Diffie-Hellman parameters, which are well known, everyone is using them, and it allows an attacker to like, do some pre-calculations that allows them to attack your, um, your handshake. So with this, this is a, a file that you can generate with a simple OpenSSL uh, CLI command, and it will provide uh, increased protection against uh, uh, attacks against the Diffie-Hellman exchange. Um, Secure renegotiate should be true these days. It is false by default in SSL module, but 
I don't see why you would need, I don't think any client out there really will break if you leave this to false. Um, on our cipher order, so this gives us the, con the control over which cipher gets selected. Um, and that's the next section, it defines which ciphers we're willing to accept, but it also defines the order in which the server will pick between what the client supports and what we prefer. Um, so this next section, um, th this, these six cipher suits should be enough for, to support basically all modern browsers or other clients that you might want to support. And in the next slide I'll show you a few backup options that, that will give you a slightly more um, client compatibility, but for most intents and purposes this should be enough. Now, um, some things to, to look at is that you, you want the elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman exchange at the top. The, below that I will have the, the, the traditional Diffie-Hellman exchange which is uh, more expensive. Um, one other thing is if you're watching this from the future um, on YouTube, so the, there is a, a new cipher coming out called uh, ChaCha20 and it's already supported in, uh, in Erlang version 18 and later, but it's, it requires OpenSSL 1.1, which is still in beta. But soon it will be out and, and ChaCha20 is a stream cipher which provides pretty much the same security as AES, but at a lower computational cost, so it's, it's just more efficient. Um, so if, if and when that comes out and you support it on your server, you'll want to top, put those at the top. Um, now, like I said, I, there are a couple of other options you might want to add for backward compatibility. So OpenSSL 098 doesn't support elliptic curve cryptography, including the elliptic curve DC Hellman. So these six are basically the copy of the ones we saw on the first page. Um, and, and, but with traditional Diffie-Hellman for compatibility with uh, OpenSSL 098, which there are still quite a few um, applications out there that are based on OpenSSL 098, unfortunately. Um, and then triple DES at the bottom. Now, tr triple DES is, is secure. There's no security risk in doing triple DES, but it's, it's very slow. So it, it's just inefficient on your server to, uh, if, to end up picking triple DES when another option is available. So um, you need it for Android before version 4, you need it for Windows XP, and you need it for Java 6. So if those are important clients for you, so leave the tri triple DES options there. Um, there's one more thing we need to do to get that A plus rating from SSL Labs, and that is the uh, plug.ssl plug, which you add to your Phoenix uh, endpoint, and that will give you HTTP strict transport security. So it will tell browsers to never accept a, a plain t a HTTP connection to this server. Once they've connected to this server, they will never fall back to a plain HTTP, so that uh, prevents downgrade attacks, where an attacker tries to trick you into loading the page over HTTP, and then they will, um, they will you know, attack, uh, launch a million in the middle attack and rely on the fact that the, the user will not notice the fact that this little padlock thing is missing. Okay, so that's, with these options I get an A plus from, uh, from SSL Labs, which is cool. Now, another thing with SSL Labs um, report, I didn't sh show it in my screenshot, but it will also give you a list of all the uh, common clients, like browsers and uh, mobile platforms, and it will tell you which, uh, if, whether or not they will succeed to negotiate uh, an SSL session with, or TLS session with your server, and, and which cipher they will choose. So if you just want to verify that you can actually support an old browser version, it's all there in the, in the report. Um, so this, this is servers, and again, I'll remind you that all those settings apply to any TLS server, not just to web servers. Um, let's talk about clients. And again, I'm, talking about, I'm going to talk about HTTP clients, because you know, we're doing a lot of HTTP, of course, but the same applies to other TLS clients. Um, and as an example, think, your, think about an, an, an API client. You're talking to the Amazon uh, API or Facebook API. Um, of course, those, you, you access those APIs over your HTTPS because you're sending a sort of API key in your request and you wouldn't want someone harvesting those API keys. So how difficult can it be to make HTTPS request? Well, let's try. Um, Erlang comes with an HTTP client out of the box. Um, all I have to do is start the INETS application and the SSL application, and then I can make an HTTP request to an HTTPS URL 
and boom, I get a 200 OK. Cool. So that wasn't so hard, was it? Um, it wasn't, and that's a bit suspicious, actually. Uh, my browser doesn't agree. My browser will not let me talk to this server, and that's because this server has a self-signed certificate. Um, now, you shouldn't trust self-signed certificates unless you yourself generated them. Um, so why did HTTPC not warn me about this? Well, it's because I didn't tell HTTPC whom to trust and whom not to trust. So it trusts everyone. And that's because the, the HTTPC just implements the, the TLS specification, but it doesn't, um, the TLS specification doesn't define who is trusted and who is not trusted. Your browser knows who it trusts, your, uh, your operating system knows who it trusts, but Erlang doesn't come with the kind of trust store that these applications and systems have. Um, you have to bring your own. So, we can fix that. We can um, get the Mozilla trust store, which the, the curl project has conveniently converted to PEM format, which is the format that the SSL module likes to get it in. So, we download the trust, trust store, we launch IEX again with the INETS and SSL application started. We make, now we call set options on HTTPC, which basically gives you some options that will all apply for any request made by the HTTP client. And we specify the socket options, verify peer, and we pass the name of the certificate trust store. Okay, let's try again. Boom. Now we get an error because fatal error, bad certificates. That's what we wanted. Unfortunately, we are not there yet. So uh, let's now talk to another URL, which does have a valid certificate issued by a valid trusted CA. And it works, 200 OK, but my browser, again, <coughs> boom. Why is it complaining now? Because the identity in the certificate doesn't match the URL that I entered in the, in the address bar of the browser. I connected to api.volton.net, but the, domain, uh, the serv certificate was issued to volton.net. In this case, it's the same top-level domain, but it could be any certificate. HTTPC will be happy with a certificate issued to uh, badhacker.org. Um, so obviously this could still be a, a man in the middle trying to snoop my API credentials. Now again, this goes back to the, the TLS specification that doesn't say, it, it says how to do the TLS handshake and how to uh, verify that the server actually has the private key associated with the certificate that it presented. Um, it knows about uh, expiry of certificates and revocation of certificates, but it doesn't specify how you, should, how you compare the certificate that the server presented to you against the identity that you were expecting to see. There is another RFC, in this case 6125, which describes for the HTTP protocol how to do that. But unfortunately, HTTPC doesn't come with a, a, a hook to, that implements this RFC. Now, this issue exists in many HTTP clients, um, so I'm showing it now with HTTPC. I'm, uh, the same happens with iBrowse, which is also an Erlang library, and with HTTP Potion, which is an Air Elixir wrapper around iBrowse. Uh, and it happens on lot, lots of other platforms too. And this is actually one of the most common implementation mistakes when using SSL or TLS, sorry. Um, now, luckily, the most popular HTTP client on hex.pm is Hackney. And also the wrapper that's, that's uh, around Hackney, which is HTTP, HTTP Poison. I don't know if that means it's the most often used because I can't see how many people use HTTPC. But luckily, um, Hackney takes care of this out of the box. So that's because it has these dependencies, Certify, which is basically the trust store, and the SSL Verify Fun, which implements that RFC I mentioned and, and uh, checks that the server certificate actually is the, the server you intended to talk to. And you can, you can use those dependencies directly and pass the right parameters into, into HTTPC. To, so if you don't want to use ACNE, if you want to use HTTP Potion, just make sure you pull in those dependencies and apply those, uh, pass those parameters. Um, uh, also, hex, uh, the hex client includes an own, uh, its own implementation, I think, of the SSL Verify fund. You, you need to remember, though, that this list might change. These certificates, just like your browser might sometimes drop a CA because it was compromised or introduce a new one, like uh, uh, Let's Encrypt, 
if, 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 you, if you want to make sure that your uh, certificate trust store is up to date, you will have to update that uh, dependency periodically. Now, the most, uh, all of these are, are basically just examples, the most common and important examples, but the, the bottom line, if there's uh, one thing to take away from, from my talk now, is uh, don't treat these things as, as magic boxes that will just work. Um, distributed Erlang, um, the TLS protocol and the SSL module that implements it, uh, they're doing, uh, doing an amazing job, but you, know, you need to understand how these things work and, and what happens under the hood. Because, um, you know, like we said, it's easy to make a mistake. And it's if, if ideally, you have this in, uh, included in your test coverage. You have a, a test case that checks that your client fails on an uh, expired certificate or um, uh, you know, see what happens to the, when, when the uh, certificate has been revoked. And, and also, for operational reasons, if you're, you know, do you know how your application responds when a certificate expires? Do you, does your, whoever is responsible for maintaining your server or your, your client, do they know how to respond quickly when, when, when that happens? Um, so if you, if you play with this a bit, you test it, then you'll be much more confident, um, confident when those things happen. Okay, so I can recommend two books. Uh, this one is actually by the, the guy behind that SSL Labs website. And it's excellent. It explains, for example, how to use the OpenSSL command line for, for testing servers. And if you want to dig deeper, implementing SSL and TLS, um, it, it would be a great exercise if you really want to understand how TLS works and, and why it works the way it works. Um, it's, it's, this book describes an implementation in C, but if you apply it to Elixir, for example, you'll learn a lot about how to do the TLS handshake and so on. So that's, those are really recommended. Um, I am not going to be able to finish this, am I? Uh, OK, denial of service. Um, is, is basically, in denial of service, I'm going to talk about um, like ways to affect your server in a, in, a, in a way that's fairly cheap for the client, but expensive for the server. Um, so it's about robustness. So if an attacker can craft some specially designed packets that will bring your server down, that obviously that's a bad thing. Um, the, um, one of them is the atom table. It's already been mentioned, but the atom table is uh, limited in size and not garbage collected. And that means that if, if it overflows, it will crash the beam. And this is not what's meant by let it crash in Erlang. Let it crash <laughs> is about processes, not about the virtual machine. Um, so you need to be very careful about converting strings to atoms. Um, and you should definitely not convert strings that are coming from the outside of your application, from HTTP requests, for example, into atoms. That was just eventually you'll run out of atom uh, uh, table entries. Um, processes and ports also have limits. So you, you need to tune those, those parameters when you start your, your virtual machine. Um, in this case, you will not crash the VM if you run out of ports, but maybe um, you know, some of your internal processing might require a process, and then because there are too many clients that are taking up all the ports, you can't start that, that process, and then your application starts to degrade because it, it can't start the internal processes that it needs. So what you want to do is limit the, the number at the edge. For example, Ranch, which lives under Cowboy, which lives under Phoenix, has a, an option to limit the no maximum number of connections that it will uh, establish. So if you cap it somewhere well below the port limit that you configured at your VM level, then you will have some spare and, and for, for your internal processing and, and error handling. Um, and also monitor it. There are um, introspection functions that uh, the, the VM provides to see what is the current number and what is the, the maximum number, and then you can see if you're getting close to the limit. Um, another topic is, is timeouts. And, uh, this is, this is mostly related to, to handling uh, load. So here's, here's an example, maybe a contrived example, but a, a client making a request to Phoenix, Phoenix calling some sort of gen server aggregator that talks to some other gen servers. It makes three requests. And then when all the data is in, it issues a response to the client. Now, the system is under load. Uh, response times uh, are increasing. And at some point, something will time out. What's going to time out? Well, obviously this one, because you know, this one has to wait for all those other three to complete. And if those are starting to take two, one or two seconds,
then the standard five second gen server timeout is not going to be enough for Phoenix to get a response. Boom, error response to the client, but the aggregator continues working. The, ag the data store continues working. So all the work is still being done, but the clients are getting error responses. They're probably going to hit reload, which is going to increase the load, and then the whole thing is starting again, and again they're going to get an error. So this just amplifies. Um, so the one way to handle this is to make sure that you set different timeouts. You can set, for example, a very short timeout at the, for the first fetch, um, maybe a slightly longer one for fetch two because you're already a bit more invested into this particular request. Um, but in any case, fetch one, two, and three, the timeouts need to add up to something um, less than the timeout of Phoenix towards the aggregator. Um, so basically, that's the, the fail fast paradigm, right? The, um, so fail fast back pressure, which Jose mentioned at this keynote already, uh, the dynamic supervisor will, will provide some, some back pressure for spawning children. So back pressure is an important technique. And these are techniques from, from microservices, basically. So what I would recommend is look at the literature for, for, back, for microservices and see how you apply that within your VM, within the actor model, add things like circuit breakers and bulkheads, which are documented in books like these, um, and, and see if you can apply that within the virtual machine and not just between uh, applications. Um, just a few more small things, if I can squeeze it in. Um, one of them is uh, Phoenix is, is, has famously uh, low latency and low jitter response times, right? We all love to get a response within a few microseconds rather than milliseconds, but um, this makes the application more susceptible to timing attacks. You know, when you sign into a website, you type the wrong credentials, you get a message that says invalid username or password. The website doesn't want to tell you whether the username was correct or not, it just leaves that ambiguous, because otherwise an attacker could do username enumeration, or even worse, if you're using email addresses to sign in, you could actually capture email addresses for phishing attacks and so on. So, but if, if, if you're um, in a Phoenix application, you know, pa password hashing takes time, so if your application does find the user record for the uh, username that was provided, and then does the password calculation and finds out that the password was wrong, the response time is going to be much higher than a, a request that came in with the wrong username. So that's a timing attack, a timing attack that leads to an enumeration attack, and you can mitigate that by basically doing the password calculation anyway, even if the user types the wrong username. And common in, which is basically the de facto library for uh, password hashing, I think, in, in Elixir, um, has a dummy check password fu function. But now you're susceptible to de denial service attacks because this is quite an expensive calculation and an attacker can send fairly, fairly cheap requests to the server with just dummy usernames and passwords. And the server will do all the hard work of, uh, of hash calculation and obviously that's another uh, thing to mitigate. So you can do something with timers. I don't have time now to talk about it, but th these are the kind of things to, to, to think about. And one last thing, and that's really the last thing. Um, if, if you think that shipping uh, beam files to your customer servers, if you're, if you're shipping applications to a customer uh, machine rather than hosting them yourself, uh, will protect your source code, so be careful because Erlang comes with the uh, option to include debug information inside the beam file. And if the debug information is there, it's pretty trivial to basically decompile that back to Erlang. It's also an interesting way, by the way, if you, if you ever wondered what your Elixir application looks like if it were written in Erlang. So you compile it to a beam file and then decompile it back to Erlang and then you, then you can learn some Erlang. Um, anyway, it, you, can, you can mitigate this because uh, Mix has an option, no debug info. But again, by default, Elixir includes debug information. Um, so you can not include it or you can strip it, for example. Um, or you can, if you do want to keep the debug information because you might want to actually debug your application, um, there is an option to encrypt it, which means that you can only really use the debug functions if you've set the right password, which is kind of cool and it's all documented in the um, I think in the Beamlib um, library. And anyway, so uh, th there has never been a better time to get serious about Elixir and Phoenix. Um, just remember to stay safe. Um, you, if, 
you can find me on uh, IRC um, and in Twitter sometimes. Um, I think if that's it. Thank you. If there are no questions, I have a bonus section, but uh, only if there are no questions. Okay, in that case, we'll take a break. That's all. Bonus section. Bonus section. Okay. Yeah. Or maybe I'll give you a teaser. What is the bonus section? You want to hear about using Phoenix as a TLS test server? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I told you about how important it is to, uh, to, to test your HTTP client when you're using HTTPS. And no, you want to use a, a, te a server to, to test against. And you know, where can we get an HTTP server? Ah, right, Phoenix. Um, now, it turns out that the, the SSL library of Erlang has a nice feature in 18, version 18 um, that helps us build a test server. So you need to specify, in, the, in your, uh, create a new Phoenix application, set the default um, certificate and, and trust store that you'll be using, and then pass in these parameters, SNI fun. That is uh, for server name indication. It's a hook that the, ser that the SSL library will call on your application to um, modify the SSL options on the fly. So as a request comes in. And what that allows you to do is um, implement a couple of uh, versions of this, of this function. One is the default one that basically uses whatever SSL options you put in your config file, but one that overrides the certificate file to point to an expired certificate, for example. So if I load expired.localtest.me, which resolves to localhost IP address, um, it will actually present the expired certificate. But it gets better because this, you can tune any SSL parameter before the SSL module sends a reply to the client. So you can even um, change the SSL version that you're going to be negotiating with the client or the ciphers that the client is, is, is going to, uh, or that the server is willing to accept. So, this is a really cool way. I, I found this out, and it, it actually allows me to build in like a minute just a test case for, for something that otherwise I would have to figure out how to set up OpenSSL command line to, to support this particular test case. Um, the only thing you need to remember is if you want to try this with OpenSSL command line, the OpenSSL uh, client simulator doesn't take the server name indication from, from the host name that you specified. You have to actually specify it using the server name parameter. That's all. Um, Thank you, let's have a break. <laughs>